everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk It Over. My name is Monica Brinkman, if this is the first time you're joining us. And with me is my wonderful co-host, Mr. Kenneth Ween. Hi, Monica. Now, Ken, um, we talk about many different things in the show. I mean, it can be cheerful things, you know, um, current events, but there was something that I thought maybe needed some clarification. And I, I, I know we'll chat about it and, and put what we know about it. And that is Christian nationalism. Okay. You want to talk about Christian nationalism? Well, first thing we got to make sure is that everybody understands we're talking about an oxymoron. An oxymoron is when you put two words or more together <clears throat> to mean something that's kind of at odds with itself, like jumbo shrimp. Mm -hmm. the, the shrimp, little jumbo big. I mean, it, it, it has its own unique meaning though. If I tell you I'm serving jumbo shrimp, you know perfectly well what I mean. Another one I like a lot is military intelligence, you know, because the idea of being, um, shooting people and the idea of intelligence kind of are opposites in a way. But yes. Put it together, you know exactly what I mean. Christian nationalism is an oxymoron, okay? It refers to a couple of viewpoints about this nation or some other nation. It, it, it is particularly found right now in the United States, but it is not uh, unique to the United States. Yes. Idea that, and what it is, is the idea that the nation is somehow derived from and connected to some notion of Christianity and that nationalism and Christianity go together. Now, if there's one thing we know about Christianity, it is a very non-nationalist position. Yeah. The oxymoron, you know, the, world, the whole idea of Catholicism, which of course is the original notion of the church, the Catholic church, and I'm not talking about the church set in Rome, I'm talking about the idea that there was supposed to be this one universal church. Mm -hmm. And um, that actually, uh, monotheism in general, it talks about the universality of the promise. So, um, you know, the exception, it's a certain extent being Judaism, but even there it was, you're gonna number like the stars and be the... Um, so what do Christian nationalists think? They think in general, in this country particularly, that the founders of the country were Christian. Mm -hmm. Now that's one thing they tell themselves. Were they Christians? I mean, that's that's something that's very much debated. And what kind of Christians were they? Uh, obviously, that's very debated. But you know, to the degree that they identified as Christian, many Puritans, I know. Well, the 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 Christianity of New England gave way, among other things, to Unitarianism. <laughs> So, you know, are they Christians? Or from, from what, uh, well, the research I've done, Ken, says that there were Christians, of course, that came among here. Them. Among but them. there were also tobacco growers and other people who had been here before. A tobacco grower and a Christian. <laughs> okay. Well, this Thomas is Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. We know that. He, he had his own very unique view of Christianity. He also was a student of the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Benjamin Franklin was not particularly devout. devout. He, he, was a, he was pretty much a free thinker. Um, so what were they really about and to what degree? They, they were not particularly Christian. Uh, they certainly were not devout Christians. 
Uh, and matter of fact, you could make a case that devout Christians at that time in the world wouldn't have rebelled against their sovereign king, <laughs> against Christianity. Exactly, um, yeah. The belief was that the kings were anointed by God. They they still are. I mean, you know, when you when you see the coronation of a king or queen of England, you know, or whatever, it's by God. Yes. So the idea then is that somehow or other that this is connected to Christianity. And another thing is that it's very supranationalistic. Okay. So what does that mean? It means that they don't see the United States being involved in the rest of the world. Nationalism is the belief that you are exist for your own country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had other parties, we've had other movements like that. Uh, we had the Know Nothing Party many, many years ago. We had the Republican Party after the First World War when they defeated uh, the, the treaty that would have brought us into the League of Nations and might conceivably have helped avoid the Second World War. Yes. Although I don't know that it would have. Um, nationalism is this belief that you basically, your country is all that matters. Well, there are a couple of things about that that make it bizarre these days. One is the fact that we got satellites. <laughs> you know, right now there's a Chinese and a Russian and a whatever satellite. Up yeah. <laughs> The other thing, and, and we have our satellites over their heads too. Yes, of course. <laughs> uh, the other thing is that climate change and, and issues like that, no, no borders. You know, uh, it would be lovely, you know, but things don't know borders. In fact, what we know is that humanity, for the most part, does not know borders. And if you read the history of the world, one of the things you quickly learn is that migration is an ongoing force. And if you go back to the Middle Ages, for instance, the, the Tatars, the Mongols, the all of these forces coming into Europe, which of course Americans mostly think of ourselves as a European nation, and we aren't, I mean, obviously we have lots of Africans, lots of Asian, but you know. People yeah. are always moving around. Uh, we can see that not only on the borders of our own southern border, but we see it in Ukraine where, you know, people are being forced to flee and they're flowing out and they're flowing into other countries. Um, yeah, what if everybody's borders were completely closed? These people have nowhere to go. Yeah. Well, if we close all the borders, which is what a nationalist wants to do, and think only about what goes on in our country, um, a lot of negatives come and some positives. I will admit there are some positives. For example, mm -hmm. if we don't buy from other countries, uh, we'll have more manufacturing jobs in the United States. On the other hand, what we buy here will be more expensive. And we'll have less. <laughs> the biggest thing about Christian nationalism, and this is where it takes a very wonky turn, is that the Christian nationalists really believe that the only function, the only function that the government has is protecting the borders. So they make a special thing about the borders, the military, things like that, because they really don't believe that the government should be doing internal things. And that's kind of a tie-in to a group that you and I've talked about before. Christian nationalism in this country is really tied to Reconstructionist Christianity, which is something I talk on and on about other times. Right. Okay. And one of the tenets of that, and this goes back, you know, way back to, to the beginnings of the Reformation, is the idea that the governance should be 
A, consistent with religion, consistent with specifically Christian religion, and it should be at the local parish level. Okay. Ultimately, one of the goals of Christian nationalists, strangely enough, is to destroy the, gov the central government. Yes. And nowhere is that clearer than in the field of education, where the goal is to destroy, I mean, right now it's to get rid of the Department of Education, but then the next thing will be the State Departments of Education. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the idea is that education should be at the parish level and all education should be parochial, which means done through the religion. So, and of course we do have that in this country, interestingly enough, I mean, to a certain degree already. Um, the most pure example of the Amish, the Amish have kind of reached the compromise with the with the government that you know kids can leave the school at eighth grade, and the Amish run their own locally controlled schools. They don't call them religious schools, I don't think, but they are. Yeah. Um, of course, we all know the Catholics have a huge parochial school system. The Jews have a smaller parochial school system, uh, you know, not just the Hebrew school kid, Jewish kids go to after school, but they actually have their own schools, yeshivas. Um, and of course, the, there was also a small number of Lutheran schools. And there are other groups uh, that are now coming forward. They call them things like legacy schools and things like that. And they are very traditional. And of course, homeschooling to a large extent, although not everybody who homeschools identifies as a Christian, or certainly not as a, a, a Christian nationalist. Right. Nationalist Christian. But a lot of the homeschoolers are contributing to that and believing in that. So there is this already huge growing parochial educational system. Now, the price that we pay for that is to what degree do children actually learn to think about the world. Now, I'm going to be very honest about this and say, I don't know that that's necessarily the outcome of the public schools either. Um, you know, public schools can be very uh, um, propaganda driven, if you will, point of view driven. Uh, I went to, uh, a, as you know, uh, I went to uh, for high school to own a kind of exclusive high end boarding school in New England. Mm -hmm. And I got to tell you, I mean, I was certainly being brainwashed in some ways about certain things. I mean, I had a whole year, much my English education, my literature, English courses, English literature courses, were all about the Civil War. And I have to tell you, you know, if I believed everything they said, um, you know, the South had the South were evil, <laughs> but also there were no brave black people. <laughs> no. All the all the brave people were basically New Englanders. <laughs> exactly. Well, what I'm wondering, Ken, uh, there have been in the past candidates who were Christian nationalists, or at least claim they were, well, in the past, and. I know that I, I believe his name is Lewis. I, I'll have to double check on that, but he, he ran. Um, and he was racist, out and out racist. He well, believed that the Christian nation also included the white man or woman to be superior to anyone else. This uh, has been an ongoing issue in American Christianity in all its forms for many, many, many years. And of course, um, to this day, 
there are denominations that are still kind of wrestling. Although I don't know of any that now publicly admit that they're wrestling. Uh, but like, for example, I mean, one of the best examples is the the, the Mormon church, you know, which is a uniquely American institution. And it was founded here. I mean, now there are Mormons in other countries, but it is it is one of the religions that came out of the United States. And it has all these revelations that take place here in the United States. There were revelations about the Native Americans and things like that. Well, um, the Mormon church said that blacks were inferior until fairly recently. I forget exactly when. Um, but, you know, the idea of Christianity and being synonymous with white is kind of a very bizarre American notion. Yeah, uh, not this American, but. <laughs> it is a bizarre American notion because of course, one of the justifications that went on for the slave trade, for the colonization, for the intrusion of Euro-Americans here into the Americas was the belief that they were going to bring people to Jesus. They were they were converting, they were saving souls. So how can you say, I saved this soul by getting him to be, a, her to be a professing to be a Christian, and then say they're not a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> but that is, yes, um, you know, but you see, now we're getting into this, this very interesting thing of the oxymorons, because so many of them, yeah. yeah. You know, the National Socialism is another wonderful oxymoron. Uh, you know, sounds great. Till you find out it's the Nazi party. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Conducting the Holocaust. <laughs> but the, ter the words sound, you know, nationalist. How would you oppose national socialists? They want to bring have common ownership of everything for all the country they want everybody and they end to the degree that hitler was in fact consistent with that he built the autobahns he made sure people had access to cars he made sure people had access to all of the best things that germany had certain to offer, as long as as long as they weren't yeah from the other groups uh but you know he well, isn't this the idea dangerous? Of, of socialism sounds good. The idea of Christian nationalism sounds good. You know, if you're it, Christian, it sounds good. Well, until you until you start looking at what Christian nationalism means. There's also a movement called Christian socialism, which is found in Europe. And so far, that's been for the most part, a very progressive kind of thing. It's, it's brought much better conditions for labor. It's brought universal health care. It's brought universal education. Um, but I, I don't know that I'd want to be a, I don't know that I'd want to be a Christian socialist either. I'd rather be uh, some kind of a human socialist. Yeah, you know, see, this is the problem I have. Why are we bringing religion into it? Especially when uh, we fled here and our forefathers even separated church and state. And why are we, why is this even coming up? Well, why is it coming up? Because it is a way of, this country is very prone to identity politics. Okay. And, you know, we got two identities here. Okay, onward Christian soldiers, we're number one. <laughs> you know, America and Christian. It's such a nice identity kind of thing. It, it, it sings to people. Okay, when you, when you create a movement, you try and come up with words that speak to people and attract people. Okay, Christian nationalism. I love Christ. I love 
America. Yay! But it's not what it really means. And, and that's this oxymoron business. That's why that's why getting people to understand that it's an oxymoron is so. Is so it cool. dangerous, Ken? Well, I hope we've added some clarity. Uh, I do want to say one more thing about this, which is that any movement like this that is based on an appeal to fundamental belief in a truth rather than belief in a process works against good government because at some point you start requiring the people in government to, especially the civil servants and the military and the police, to endorse a specific belief system. In yes. other words, you're asking them to become authoritarian. Whereas exactly. those of us who believe in a process want people to devote themselves to the process and that, that then depends what that process is, of course. And for me, my part, it is a democratic, scientific, humanistic, investigative process. So it is a process where we talk about things, we explain things, we explore things, we try and get a better handle on the skins with constantly learning. That is the underlying, those are the underlying meanings of words like Republican and Democrat. Okay, they're process driven words. One of the things, you know, I'm very much about Monica, and you know this is something called epistemology, it's how we know. And it, unfortunately, it's probably the most difficult single subject in the world. <laughs> yeah. Talk about. <laughs> And I talk about it endlessly, not because I know all the answers, but because I'm so fascinated by the fact that we know things in so many, many different ways. And if we don't keep talking about how we know, then we will get deceived by what we think we know. Exactly. Okay. And I worries me that we are now on the cusp of a new age, okay? We, we really are on the cusp of a new age. You know, I, I was just reading a book about the, about the Middle Ages. I read a lot of history, you know, here, there, everywhere. Anyway, you know, they're talking about some of the things that created the, the change from Middle Ages to modern times, and basically, you know, it's the Reformation is one thing, but the printing press is another. <laughs> and, you know, now we're, we're in a new age, okay, where we're, we're discovering new laws of quantum physics. We're discovering new yes. ways of thinking about things. So we're, fascinating. We're learning, we're learning that even creating algorithms to, to run a computer or to, to have you know, we have to think about different way, how many algorithms do we need to do it properly kind of thing. We're, we're on the edge of a new age, an age of, of computer driven, much more than we think now, uh, robotics, cyborgs, all these things. And we, it's threatening. It is very threatening. It's very scary, especially to the people who don't understand it. And, you know, especially if we're older, I mean, you know. Well, they rejected the car when it first came out and the planes. <laughs> so. Yeah, people that we have always rejected because we're threatened by, we don't understand, etc. And what's happening now is because we are so threatened, we are grabbing hold of a life raft. And that life raft is, I hate to say it, that life raft is, among other things, Christian nationalism. We want something. We want something that we think we know what it is. We think we know that it's safe. We think we, it will protect us and it will help us deal with the 
change that's coming. Reality is, folks, and here is my the the final thing I'm going to say. Okay. <laughs> yes, is that change comes. You know, I am sure there were a lot of people who, when Columbus came back and uh, said, "Hey, we can go that way." <laughs> there were a lot of people who wanted to lock him up and say, no, no, we must never do that. Yeah, the world's flat. You can't have gone anywhere. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, at one point, in fact, before Columbus, um, the Chinese had sent the fleet around the world. And there's a lot of evidence about this. And when they got back, the Chinese decided this was a terrible thing to have done, and they boarded, walled up their country, basically, and refused to, to continue exploring, and you know, basically said, no, we're not doing this anymore. And uh, they ended up, years later, in, you know, in a very bad place. All of that technological advantage, all, all that potential growth, you know, they developed gunpowder. They were actually the first ones doing printing. They, they all of a sudden, it's squeezed down. And the next thing you know, the Europeans are carving up China. <laughs> you can't hide your head in, in the sand like an ostrich and hope that the change will blow by. Change is a coming, it's blowing in the wind. <laughs> and the best thing we can do, and this is kind of like a, one of my most beautiful metaphors for the United States. One of the things that the American founders did, one of the seminal actions of an American founder was Ben Franklin flying his blooming kite and discovering the nature of electricity. Yeah. Now, you know, we cannot overestimate how important that moment was. So I'm going to say the wind's blowing and it's time for us as a nation to fly those kites, relish change, Get jump into the jump into the process and grow. Yeah, because we're going to end up doing it anyway eventually. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, or somebody else will do it to us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed our little chat today. Um, if you have some comments, and but be kind. And respectful please uh, go ahead and, and put them down because we love hearing from you and we always welcome guests on the show so if you have an idea or something you'd like to chat about be sure and get in touch with us we're on facebook and also have a website let's talk it over ken thank you so much um i didn't i didn't know as much as you about this subject so i'm so glad that you're here with me <laughs> take care guys bye-bye hi i'm amanda tyler executive director of bjc and co-host of the respecting religion podcast the term christian nationalism is getting a lot of attention these days but there's often confusion about what that term means. I even hear people conflate Christian nationalism with Christianity. As a Christian myself, I can't stand when I hear my religious tradition equated with a harmful political ideology. So let's set the record straight. Christianity is a religion, one that is practiced by more than 2 billion people around the world, including many millions of Americans. Followers of Christ are diverse. We are spread across the planet, and we have different denominations, practices, theologies, and political views. So then, what is Christian nationalism? It's a political ideology and cultural framework that merges American and Christian identities. Christian nationalism teaches that to be a true American, you must be a Christian, and that to be a real Christian, you must affirm certain political positions. Nothing could be farther from the truth. 
I understand why some might confuse Christian nationalism with Christianity, since Christian nationalism misappropriates Christian symbols and Christian language, including crosses, the Christian flag, and various Bible verses. Christian nationalism confuses political and religious authority. As Christians, we are called to pledge our ultimate allegiance to God, not to any specific nation. But Christian nationalism turns love of one's country into an idol, pushing Christians to sacrifice our theological convictions when they come into conflict with the priorities of the nation or the politically powerful. As Christians, we are called to resist all idols and to love our neighbors as ourselves. That's why the Christians Against Christian Nationalism movement is bringing together Christians to speak out against the harmful political ideology, especially when it inspires acts of violence and intimidation. I'm in this fight against Christian nationalism because I know that faith freedom must be for people of all faiths and the non-religious, or it isn't faith freedom. As a Christian, I don't want Christian nationalism to be the only public witness of my faith. Christians have a responsibility to offer an alternative witness in the public square in partnership with people of all faiths and the non-religious. I hope you'll join me in this effort.